from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 60, recorded on September 23rd, 2020. Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nell Zeldi. Hey there, Vincent. Uh, great to be with you and back in LD Lab Studios for the first time in a while. Yeah. How long has it been? Is Oof, it like January, yeah. fe February, at least March, maybe? March, I think. It's a long time. There. Transition, yeah, to LD Home Studios and uh, <laughs> LD <laughs> Nursery Studios. So we're still, of course, running in the orange category, very restricted um, situation. And honestly, a little bit of some spikes in our um, numbers here, even in the last um, mm. week or so, which sort of vaulted ba Utah back onto the top five among states for new cases currently. So not out of the woods yet, to say the least. Is that because students came back? Yeah, exactly. So most of this is, um, so students came back. Um, we're still looking at that at the University of Utah. Um, south of here, though, so in Utah County, which inc includes Provo and another major university, BYU, um, that's where the main driver in terms of case numbers. Mm. Yeah, well. How are things there? Yeah, New York is uh, a little bit up, but it's not huge. Um, yeah. New York City's public schools started on Monday, this past Monday. So uh, they're they're virtual. So I don't think there's going to be any issue with that. Columbia is virtual, so I'm not sure we're going to see an uptick. The only I'm not sure what the what the status with the restaurants is. I know in New Jersey they are increasing restaurant capacity from 50 to 75 uh, percent. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, that's asking for trouble because we know that's where these things transmit in social situations with a lot of people around, you know? Yeah. But exactly. um, we'll see what happens. But, you know, UNC was, a, was ridiculous. They didn't have a good plan. They all came back. They decided they were going to have in-person classes. Boom. They had to shut down. You know what? I don't think they ever asked Ralph Barrick what he thought. <laughs> I would have, I would have <laughs> definitely had him in the conversation. One of the things that uh, is happening here is, and I think there was a little bit of foresight, was to introduce a, what they're calling a circuit breaker into the academic season. So the University of Utah is going all online. This was planned for two weeks. It also coincides, it turns out, with the vice presidential debate, which mm -hmm. will be on campus. Um, and so that will also be kind of a, you know, kind of a crazy concentration of excitement, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. um, trying to keep things, uh, yeah, trying to cool things off here. Um, Hasn't been that level of UNC or, you know, I think we've heard some stories around the country, University of Alabama, where the numbers are just absolutely spiking. I think that we'll continue to see this in the coming weeks. But yeah, some, enough troubling signs that having that place to, to step back makes sense. In this case, it's sort of a plant scenario. We had Ralph on a few weeks ago on TWIV, and he said he's worried now these kids are going to go to school. It's going to be an outbreak. Then he says, what do kids do when they get sick? They go home. So they're going to go back home and bring the virus with them and start outbreaks in their town. Right. So it's just a bit of a disaster. <laughs> exactly. Crazy. Well, on a maybe more positive note, we're kind of celebrating a fun milestone today. This is episode 60 of Tuivo, our five years of podcasting together. Wow. Let's see. When did we start? Let's, let me look it up. Microbe. Oh. Where do I find this? Microbe.tv slash Tuivo, right? <laughs> oh, yep. <laughs> five years worth it's five years worth of episodes basically right um, exactly i'm remembering right we might have done two up front just to kind of get a little bit of a running start so it was about this time of the year in september five years ago i think when we sat down and hatched this thing <laughs> here we go archive number one when scientific worlds collide mm. uh, was posted on december 12 2015 not not far off. Um, uh, it, it's uh, five years. Yeah. Look at that. And there's a picture of you and me from uh, ASV. Yeah, that was fun. So that was the um, that was when you were president of ASV. So that, was that 2015 also? Correct. Okay. So yeah. that was in July. And I had said 
in a, in a bar to you, <laughs> uh, let's start a podcast on evolution. Uh-huh. And you said, let me think about it, yep. which is, which is smart. <laughs> and, uh, I said, you would be perfect for this. Uh, you know, the, not just viruses, but evolution of everything. Mm-hmm. And I think it was around the fall, you decided that you wanted to do it, right? It was actually, you know, it didn't take too long. And so even though we posted in December, I think we might've started recording in September because we okay. did two or three episodes to sort of, you know, have a few in the can just so that we, as we were kind of figuring out our way and I mean, you were, of, of course, and uh, no rookie to podcasting. Mm-hmm. We have already more than five years old, I think, by the time we uh, got things started. But I was just, you know, a total rookie. And so, um, you know, wise to, I think, see how this might go on a couple of um, sort of pilot episodes. Um, <laughs> but uh, so far, so good as we speak now, five years on. I'm looking for episode one show notes. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Oh boy, look at this. October recorded on 929. You're absolutely right, Dr. LD. Always smart. And uh, episode one, 929. And it says this episode will be posted question mark. I didn't know when we were going to post it. Ah, boy. It's five years to the month. Perfect timing. And you know, the funny thing is I I mispronounced your last name on that first episode. So I didn't know it was LD. I I remember that moment too. And I was still so kind of podcast shy, podcast shy that I don't think I corrected you until we got to the second episode. No, you did right away. The first episode, because I called you Eld. Now it's Eld. You said, no, it's I've, Eldy. I've been called far worse. So. You know, it's funny. I mean, I did. I introduced you at ASV and I should have remembered your name, right? Oh, yeah. But, uh, well, and as I've done more podcasting, I'm pretty sympathetic to um, trying to in real time, come up with pronunciation. Yeah, it's hard. And, yeah, it's pretty tricky. Uh, I do, when I do papers and re- read the authors, I, I I just mangle them because, well, the cool thing is people are from all over the place, right? That's neat. Uh, nice. All countries doing science, but it makes it harder for us uh, Americans who don't know much about overseas. <laughs> I feel like I'm especially bad at pronouncing names somehow. Like I my brain just sort of, um, you know, short circuit somehow. So uh, Nels, and, um, in, in retrospect, are you glad you did it? Or do you regret it? Do you think it's a horrible time sink or has it been positive? And do you want to continue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of questions, yeah, you know, you yeah, should never yeah. ask more than one question, by the way, <laughs> that I, I violated a main rule, but for you, it's okay. It's fine. And uh, it's strong, positive yes answers across the board. Now, this has been so much fun and has allowed me to grow in ways I didn't anticipate. So, you know, I think as many of us as scientists, sometimes communicating our science or communicating other people's science is a lot easier said than done. Um, And it's something we don't talk about a lot when we train, right? When we were grad students, we were postdocs, kind of all you know, full steam ahead on the science itself, designing experiments and not really talking about the other really key and critical parts of our job. Right. And so I think it's really natural for us to then communicate the same as if we were doing an experiment where we're trying to capture every nuance, et cetera. And that for me, it was um, even worse than trying to pronounce a complicated first and last name. It was just sort of a, 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 a real short circuiting event where it was hard to get the ideas out. And so podcasting, has really been a gift to, um, and, and I see this sort of in selfish ways in terms of um, just as I'm presenting my own science using um, the experience from us kicking around other people's science. Yeah. But then I think even more than that, it, this what has been really fun, I didn't anticipate this at all, was, um, you know, as other folks came interested in asking me, oh, you run a podcast, could you give me some advice or help mm-hmm. me out? And at first I felt like, you know, you're asking the wrong person, but the more we've done it, the more these have been really productive conversations. And I think what's really fun about that is to see some of the uh, new podcasts and sort of related science communication efforts that some of the trainees in my neighborhood and other places are putting together that have kind of gotten some energy. And hopefully I've been a little bit helpful uh, in, in because of this experience. So my goodness, for me, this has been super fun and um, I'm learning a lot and it's uh, kind of contributing in ways to my own, I think, scientific um, training that I didn't anticipate at all. So great. Uh, count me in as long as you want to do Tuivo, Vincent. Count me. How about you? Are you uh, 
So we did those three episodes and kind of on a trial basis. Maybe this is our five year trial. Are you <laughs> feeling? No, we're way week? we're way past the trial <laughs> period. Episode, uh, what is it? Thirty five? No, sixty. Sorry, uh, I just it's, did immune thirty five. Yeah. Um, no, no. I, I thought from the beginning it would be really interesting because you know you look at viruses in a different way, and that way, from an evolutionary standpoint is what is becoming increasingly important in virology. Mm. And I and I also recognize that, you know, the molecular tools have been applied to other organisms as well, and it would be really interesting. And you were the person, I thought, who could do that. And so I, I figured I'd learn a lot, and I have. It really influences uh, how I think about viruses and other podcasts as well. So for me, it's been mm. great. And the guests have been amazing. You know, uh, all really interesting, smart people, uh, interactive. So it's it's great. I really enjoy it. Fantastic. Yeah. I think we're we have good energy for to push ahead. Into yeah, there's no question. There's no question <laughs> that I will continue um, yeah. as long as I can. You know, um, I'm going to be podcasting the rest of my life, basically. I hope to live into my 90s or at least 80s, late 80s, right? It's another 20 years of podcasting. and um, you know, if I start to forget things and I can't think well, then we'll just, you know, you can get somebody else, but I'll go as long as I can. I'm pretty healthy, so. <laughs> Let's do it, man. This sounds great. Keep so speaking it. of guests, um, today's episode, I think it's going to be really interesting, really fun. So we decided, since it is five years, we decided to do something a little different, something we haven't done before, a bit of an experiment in podcasting, I guess. So we reached out to um, some leading evolutionary thinkers, colleagues, friends, scientists, um, around the world. And um, this includes younger folks, uh, up and coming stars. This includes some seasoned veterans um, as well. And we asked them to record a two to five minute Zoom clip. Now that we're all familiar with mm -hmm, Zooming mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, recording ourselves talking over computers, uh, let's take advantage of that new experience. And the topic we put out there was what are some exciting directions you see the field of evolution heading? And what are you and your lab doing about it in the upcoming five years? Put sort of a, a, a window onto it. And at least for me, Vincent, you know, this was inspired in large part by this letter we read um, a few episodes back. This is from Tia, mm -hmm. who's a high school teacher in, in Virginia. And um, she takes snippets of our podcast, of your podcast as well, and shares this with her students. Um, and first of all, you know, kudos for... Um, doing some editing. Sometimes we can, these episodes can go on for a while. So I think there could be some cases where just sort of distilling a few key points could make a lot of sense. But what Tia said, and this still, it's really touched me and, and continues to, um, that she said that we're painting a vivid picture for non-scientists like her and her students of how modern science works. And that as insiders, we might not know how uplifting this is. Uh, getting a glimpse of the world in which meritocracy is so valued is a and is a beautiful antidote to a lot of the negative stuff in the world today. And so when you mention the names of every ethnicity and nationality, discuss the work of male and female colleagues with unquestioning equal respect, and otherwise just do your mm. normal thing, it is a balm. I mean, what an mm. incredibly uh, generous uh, note that we got from Tia. Yeah, it's great. <clears throat> and so <laughs> I mentioned that to some of these, um, some of our colleagues, some of these leading thinkers. Um, and, and there was, it inspired them as well. And, I, and we'll see that today. Cool. So we wrote to about 70 <laughs> different evolutionary scientists. So we were also thinking, you know, everyone is, it's the beginning of the academic season. We're all scrambling. We're overcommitted. We're still figuring out daycare at home, working scenarios, et cetera. And so we cast a pretty wide net at about 20 or so folks actually wrote back almost immediately, um, saying they were interested. Um, again, we're working under, a, like, we're all pretty stressed out these days, moving into six months plus of this pandemic, but about 12 people, um, took that leap. They sent, uh, uh we set up a, a Dropbox link. They sent us clips two to five minutes long. And so today's episode, that's going to be, uh, what we stepped through. So we'll play these clips. We'll have both, of course, the audio as you're listening to the podcast. And then, um, as we've started to do, or as Vincent has, you know, as you've started to do to then post it on YouTube. And I think all but one or two of these clips are actually, there is a video component as well. And so cool. um, we can both see and listen 
to that answer to that question. Uh, what's exciting in the field of evolution? What, is you, what are you and your group uh, doing about it? Nice. And, and I should say, Nels has, has heard these all, but I have not. So this will be my first time. <laughs> That's right. So I've listened to them once. but so And then I think what we'll do is play that and then just comment really quickly uh, kind of on uh, you know, spontaneously our reactions to some of the, these great, and I, and just as a preview, it is worth it to listen to these. So it was, again, another kind of inspiring set of um, contributions that continue to put wind in my sails in the same way that Tia's original letter did. Now, now some of these people were on TWIV, but not all of them. Yeah, that's right. And so Twiv, actually, Twivo, those, Twivo. Uh, yeah, Twivo. So among those 70, um, I tried to reach out to as many of our, um, guests that we've had on. And of course, we'll have some of these folks who haven't been on yet, I'm sure, as they're publishing papers, et cetera, we'll have them back on. Um, and so we'll see a familiar face or two from Twivos in our, from our first five years. And Vincent, there's also right at the end, uh, I'll save it for the end. It's worth it to watch it. We have a special, a special musical-like presentation nice. from one of our colleagues. Yeah, scientists <laughs> are talented, right? <laughs> well, 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 hold your judgment. We'll see. <laughs> this will be this will be the finale Very good. Very good. for today's episode. So, anyway, I wanted to just open up with a big thank you to all of the folks who entertained this idea, whether you contributed or not. Um, uh, all you know, it's w w one of the things this exercise is reminding me of is how incredibly rich um, the sort of combinations of backgrounds, experiences, interests in the field of evolution and it is vibrant there is i mean it is growing in some exciting ways and i think we'll get a nice kind of tasting menu of that coming up here uh, in the episode so why don't we um dive right into the lineup here vincent so okay. i think the game plan is i will try to we're uh, working here in zoom and i will <laughs> share my screen hit play on the videos um our first Contributor, contributor is, and I'll just try to do a quick intro for each, is Lillian Fritz Leyland. And so Lillian is an evolutionary cell biologist. She's, her lab is at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she really comes from a cell biology background, thinking about how cells move, and then putting that into an evolutionary perspective in really unique and interesting ways. Hey, Nels. Uh, I'm so happy you're doing this episode. I think it's going to be really delightful. I can't wait uh, to see it um, and hear what everybody has to say. So anyway, I'll get right to it. So you asked us uh, where we're excited uh, to see evolution go, the field, uh, and what we're doing about in the next five years. Uh, so I have to say, I am just so stoked uh, about all the different organisms for which we're starting to get molecular genetic tools. So uh, for a long time, people really sort of narrowed our focus in on a few uh, model, model systems. Um, and we understand in some molecular detail the biology of, of uh, these sort of handful of organisms. Um, and so one thing that's happening right now is that we're sort of going back out uh, again and sort of opening the sort of the reverse funnel um, and developing um, molecular genetic tools for a large diversity of organisms, different eukaryotes, uh, archaea, and bacteria. And so uh, I'm pretty excited not only that we're developing these new systems, uh, as a field, but um, the pace at which we're um, developing new uh, molecular genetic systems is actually increasing. And I think um, different communities are learning from each other about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so I think that we're just watching the beginning of this cascade of uh, uh, molecular tool development. And so uh, I think this is particularly exciting uh, for the organisms that are really way out there that are not closely related to systems that have been studied before. Uh, and that's because when you look in their genomes, it turns out that they have a lot of genes uh, for which uh, we can assign no function. They don't look like any other genes. Um, and so it's possible that those are just divergent examples of genes that we know, that we, the sequences have just changed so much that we can't recognize them. But um, I put down a lot of money um, that there's actually like really cool biology that we have no idea yet. Um, and so as some of these systems come online, and in particular, we developed systems for, and tools for sort of forward genetic screens or that sort of equivalent uh, discovery-based approach. Uh, we're going to find some really cool stuff, some new biology. So I just, I'm just totally excited about that. Um, and so my group is sort of contributing to this um, in developing tools um, for two uh, different, org uh, different organisms. Uh, the first are chytrid fungi. Um, and so these shared a common ancestor um, uh, with animals uh, way before the diversification 
of uh, dicaria, which include the sac fungi and the mushrooms, the yeasts, uh, the other sort of heavily studied uh, fungal groups. And so uh, they also have a lot of biology that seems in some senses more reminiscent of uh, animal cells than it does of fungi. Uh, they have a flagellum, a motile flagellum, so they can swim. Uh, they can crawl uh, like a white blood cell or an amoeba uh, and uh, have cell stages that don't have a cell wall. Um, and so we're developing molecular tools there to start uh, to be able to test hypotheses uh, about the uh, early evolution of fungi. Um, and then the other system we're working on is Niglaria, uh, and that comes from a you know way far out there uh, branch of the eukaryotic tree, uh, the heterolobosians. Um, and so uh, they have also really cool cell biology. They have uh, stages that have no microtubules. Uh, actually, most of the lifetime of the cell has no microtubules. It has lots of action stuff. That's pretty cool. And they can uh, differentiate into a flagellate that can swim. Um, uh, and it builds an entire microtubule cytoskeleton in an hour, including transcription and translation. Um, and so both of these systems are actually important in terms of health. Uh, so chytrid fungi are the um, uh, parasites that are wiping out amphibian populations across the world. Uh, and species of Niglaria include Niglaria phalari, which is a brain-eating amoeba um, that is 95% uh, fatal um, in terms of people that we know that they've been infected. And so, uh, anyway, so we're uh, pretty excited to be developing molecular tools and also uh, learning about the basic biology of these organisms uh, because their cell biology is really cool. Um, anyway, so that's what we're doing. Um, I hope that's useful for your show. And again, I can't wait to see it. All right. I really hope to see you soon. Bye. Very cool. Yeah. Now, first, Nels, uh, I'm impressed. She not only has headphones, but looks like she has a mic there off to the yeah. side. Great well, points, I, many points for that, because most right. people shout at their computer, right? <laughs> that's true. And so maybe that is one side effect of the Zoom era is we're getting more sophisticated in our ability to record yeah. so, uh, and, and, and hopefully more comfortable, because I think this is a way to, to share our science with a broader audience. And so actually, sure. I can't think of a better person to kick it off than Lillian. Isn't that exciting to hear about, um, I think, you know, a few things that to pick up on. And I should say, by the way, so we'll put links to all of the websites of our contributors today as, as mm. our, to our listeners. If you want to go deeper on any of these topics, yeah. that'd be a great sort of entree into them. By the um, way, Nels, um, I, I think, you know, people should, who do zoom should try and improve their sound and video because it makes a big difference. I'm on a lot of zoom calls as everybody is. And I was on one yesterday and I, I could barely understand one of the participants, you know, and that doesn't allow good communication. So it doesn't take much to do a good Zoom call. You don't have to do what I do, but uh, you can get a reasonably priced mic and headphones really help. Uh, if your laptop is new, you know, the video camera on it is okay. Otherwise, get a webcam. But I think we're going to go forward doing more and more of this. So it really not be blurry and sound terrible, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I agree with you. And, and it is. I mean, it's a challenge, right? So obviously, um, being able to communicate in person takes away all of these barriers. But the closer we can get to that, um, just uh, it helps to share what we're talking about, um, sure. broadly speaking. And so sure. no, I agree with you. Yep, yep, yep. So anyway, so a couple of points I just wanted to highlight and um, sort of underline a little bit. So one is exactly her point, and we've talked about this on Twivo in our first five years, the kind of democratization of model systems it would be one way of maybe saying it. because we have all of these new tools and these you know the power to do genomics in a whole different scale mm -hmm. to start bringing this to organisms that might have otherwise been ignored and so Lillian in her lab is doing this in incredible ways with the two really interesting creatures that she yeah um, was describing right and oh, with the chytrids the chytrids those are the ones that are aren't they wiping out the bats isn't that white nose so that's um, the um, chytrids are getting the amphibians, the frogs, the salmon. amphibians. Okay, yeah, yeah, Got yeah, it. yeah, and and it's serious. I mean, these are extinction level events, yeah. and so yeah. we're seeing evolution, you know, in real time when it comes to host pathogen interfaces, because yeah. there are lineages that are uh, coming to a screeching halt, unfortunately, uh, in part because of the chytrid fungi, um, and you know, with all the other pressures in terms of habitat loss, climate change, and everything mm -hmm. else that's already doing this, then you add a, a, a pretty um, potent pathogenic fungus in, into this mix. And it, it's really, uh, really desperate times for a lot of amphibian yeah. species. Yeah. Um, 
from a bigger picture too, what's really exciting. So there's, you know, these very practical and important ecological implications, but the cell biology is of these things is just beautiful. And so Lillian, I think is really at the forefront of this um, push in evolutionary cell biology. Take, we've talked a little bit about this. So episode 11 um, with some of Nicole King's work on multicellularity. And this is one of those kind of not handful of traditional model species, the quanaflagellate. Um, kind of revisited this when we were together in Germany at the giant yep. virus. Meeting, yep. right? And so, um, you know, bringing the cell biology to life mm-hmm. in a different way or through the lens of the systems that have been almost ignored by modern science. And yeah. now seeing this rejuvenation, um, really exciting thing happen things happening at the interface of cell biology and evolutionary biology. I was, I just did a seminar at the university of Tennessee, which is where Steve Wilhelm is, who was on our TWIV at Tegger and C. I mean, after the meeting, he had invited me to visit. And of course that was canceled. And he said, um, well, the next giant virus is, uh, uh, November, 2021. So hopefully we'll all be able to go back then. Yeah, I hope so. Not sure yet, but yeah, keeping my fingers crossed. That was it, it's really and the, you know the neglaria that as she she mm. said that brain eating uh, amoeba is uh, that's interesting. I didn't know anyone who worked on that. We should, I'm going to say this for everyone on this list. Probably we should get her on at some point. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> we will do that. It's sort of a preview of the next yeah. five years in some. It's sense. a tasting menu, right, Nels? Right. <laughs> there you go. Very much so. Um, and yeah, so this is this is in the news every once in a while. You hear about yeah. you know kids or folks going swimming in a pond or um, small lake and end up unfortunately dying, and so, and very rarely. Um, but these are this is the um, causative infectious microbe underlying mm-hmm. this. These so-called brain-eating amoebas in really an awful way to go. Um, uh, again, the cell biology absolutely fascinating, and the evolutionary distance as she pointed out. So you know. We've been kind of myopic as um, in the field over, mm-hmm. traditionally over the years, and even some of what seems like the more exotic or choices and model systems are really just um, a very small sampling of the diversity of life around us. And so mm-hmm. these guys might as well be from outer space, um, kind mm-hmm. of. I would say in that kind of phylogenetic framing, and so incredible open holes in the tree to explore. Um, this being one of them. All right, so. Um, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's keep going. Yep. And thanks again, Lil. That was really fun. Great. We're off to a great start. So our next contributor uh, is someone who showed up on Twivo at the uh, ASM meeting when we did a couple of interviews in person. So this is Talia uh, Karasov. She's an evolutionary geneticist uh, here in my backyard in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Utah. And so I couldn't resist a, you know, a little bit of a mm. local... Sure. Um, you were here as a chance to also mention, Vincent, we just hired at Utah in the last couple of years, five evolutionary geneticists that added to our faculty. Nice. And we're planning to do maybe five more in the next five years. So anyway, if you're interested in evolutionary genetics, keep an eye on Utah and folks like Talia, who just opened her lab. And I think as you'll hear uh, in a moment, are doing really exciting work that uh, might be something that uh, some of our listeners might be interested in as well. Hi, Nels and Vincent. This is Tali Karasov here, dialing in from the University of Utah. Firstly, I wanted to congratulate you on the fifth year anniversary of Twivo of this great show. I am ever the fan, ever the admirer. So I'm here to talk briefly about what I as an evolutionary biologist am I excited about for the future of evolutionary biology, what I see as the upcoming advances. So this is not a hard topic for me because I think right now is a particularly exciting time to be studying evolutionary biology because of a few technological advances. I am a microbial enthusiast. I like to study how bacteria evolve to colonize different environments, particularly how bacteria evolve to colonize different host species. I like to ask questions about how a bacterium becomes a pathogen in the plants, for example, but then cannot pathogenize insects or humans. What are the barriers to colonizing different host species? So what about right now enables me to ask these questions better than I could, let's say, a decade ago or a generation ago? 
Recent advances in sequencing technologies and in genetic engineering technologies enable me to understand evolution across species at scales that I have never been able to study before and to test hypotheses at scales I have never been able to test before. Sequencing technologies are now enabling me to sequence thousands of microbial genomes, to compare the sequences of thousands of different pathogens, to understand which genes are evolving between these pathogens. And this enables me to de develop the hypotheses for which genes and which genetic changes are important for a microbe to colonize one host versus another. Then I can go over to the genetic side and I can use genetic engineering to test these individual hypotheses to understand which genetic changes exactly enable a microbe to colonize one host versus another. So these are just a few of the reasons that I'm particularly excited about studying evolutionary genetics right now. And they're not specific to the host microbe system or to the microbial system, and instead are applicable across many different species to the understanding of evolution in general. So right now is a very exciting time to be studying evolutionary biology, and I am ever excited to hear about advances from Tuivo in the upcoming episodes now and hopefully for years to come. So thanks again, Nels and Vincent, and congrats again. So the other thing I'm noticing now, so far two out of two yeah. people are at home, right? Which is really rare for scientists, but now we have to be home. I'm, I'm curious to see how many of the rest will be home as well. Yeah, this is a little bit of the new normal as we're <clears throat> trying to continue to navigate the pandemic working from home. So um, for <laughs> another, I, you know, each of these videos, they just, as I was previewing them mostly last night, I just kept getting more and more excited. And this is an yeah. uh, example of it, right? So a couple of things again to underline. So Talia mentioning these advances in genomic technology, right? That just opens up these doors. And then combining that, and I think this will be a theme that we will continue to see with sort of these functional approaches to even drill down to mm. single amino acid changes or single mutations that have real consequences. And then what, how do we apply this? So, of course, again, one of our favorite topics, microbial evolution. Um, but in this case, you know, these themes, I think, go whether it's bacteria, um, in the case of Talia's work, um, or viruses, some of the major concepts what, that evolution has something to say about host switching, host range. How do you think about that conceptualized uh, in ways that will start to give us some real understanding um, for the uh, microbes that uh, we're up against? Um, both today and into the future as well. So um, Talia just arrived here in Utah. Her lab is up and running. She was she did her um, postdoc in Germany in Tübingen in Detlef Weigel's lab, and you can hear a little bit about that. So I just looked it up. Episode forty five of Tuivo, uh, the microbial secrets of mouse ear crest. So using mm. traditional model system Arabidopsis, and then the pathogenic mi microbes um, that uh, infect it to really advance this from sort of an evolutionary perspective and beyond. And so also check out Alia's website for more info about some of the cool new directions that she's going to be taking her research program. As well. Let's keep moving here. Our third video is from Andrew Kern. And Andy just moved his lab. He was at Rutgers for many years, a uh, population geneticist, um, thinking about genomes, as we'll see. Um, it is now located at the University of Oregon in Eugene. Um, hopefully not suffering, continuing to suffer too much from the wildfire smoke. This has been an ongoing uh, crisis in the uh, Pacific Northwest, all up and down the West Coast, actually. And so um, Andrew weighed in on uh, what he's up to and, and uh, what's cooking in the Kern lab. Hey, I'm Andy Kern. I'm a uh, professor at University of Oregon um, and an evolutionary biologist. And um, I was asked to talk for a couple minutes about uh, what I think is a really exciting direction in evolutionary biology right now, the sort of late 2020. Um, and to me, the thing that I settled on is this ongoing effort to try to infer the complete genealogical history um, of a set of genomes on the basis of uh, population genetic techniques. So. This is an exciting idea because consider the following thing. If you take a species like uh, the human species, there actually exists one genealogical history for our entire species, okay? And this, 
relates the ways in which our um, our relatives are related to one another, how we are related one to another, and how different portions of our genome actually um, share and differ in their set of ancestors going back in time. So if you consider one species, there exists some fixed genealogical history that describes the pattern of common descent to the present day. Now, it just so happens that over the, the past year, uh, a few different groups have developed methods that would enable us to infer this genealogical history, what we call in the business the ancestral recombination graph, at scale, such that we can take, um, say, thousands of genomes that exist in the public record and try to infer the genealogical history that connects those genomes. This is a particularly important goal because ultimately, Evolution, at evolution is a tree-like process. So if we can infer the tree-like branching history of genomes, we can get to sort of the ultimate stuff of evolution. Now in our lab, uh, we're particularly interested in, in sort of two directions of this problem. The first is developing better methods for actually inferring this, this genealogical history, inferring this ancestral recombination graph. Um, and that's a, a, a daunting technical problem. And the second is, were we to have this information in hand, were someone to drop in your lap the true genealogical history of a species, the true ancestral recombination graph for some species, how can we best utilize that information for, for doing evolutionary inference. In particular, with an ancestral recombination graph in hand, we might be able to do a much better job of, say, um, connecting genetic variation with phenotypic variation. Or we might be able to do a much better job of inferring past population size histories from the population in question, or inferring um, modes of evolution, be they uh, adaptive evolution, or instead sort of the history of stabilizing selection in a region of the genome. So ultimately, the one thing that I'm super bullish on here in September 2020 is inference of ancestral recombination graphs using population genetic data. It's going to be bananas. Great. That's a great one. Thanks so much, Andy. So this is a human-centric interest, right? Or it could be uh, any any reproduct any sexually reproducting population, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. And I think the really driving force of it is some of these really long running questions and population genetics of how, you know, populations behave, how mutations move through them. Mm. Um, but then to take advantage, I mean, increasingly, uh, again, with sort of genomes, as Andy was saying, becoming publicly available, um, all of a sudden this opens up some possibilities to do this. Yeah. Um, humans. And so, um, I think really an invigorating uh, era for population genetics, some of the quantitative features for thinking about mutations. And then as he was saying, connecting that back to, you know, how do we kind of get signal from noise? What are, where is selection acting? Where is it maybe doing that less so? And to, you know, bring in that sort of genealogic to connect that. I mean, it was, it's mm. just uh, a really big goal, obviously, and really ambitious. And so I really like that big thinking um, approach here. Yeah, now, is it possible to detect uh, population insults by infectious agents? Well, yeah. So that's a big um, that's a big uh, cottage industry, so to speak. One that we that we work on, and so we have a, a handful of tools, but they're not at that resolution or depth Man. that Andy's describing. Right? We have um, some tricks, and you know, to sort of try to pull some things out. Um, but we're really in our infancy, and all, a lot of these tool, existing tools. Uh, make assumptions. They have blind spots, like any other tool. They have strengths yeah. and weaknesses, yeah. and so that's where I think kind of uniting population genetics and some of these approaches he's describing to um, that that concept of that recombination graph, that in that kind of massive sort of ancestral or uh, ancestral or genealogic view. Uh, easier said than done, but starts to open up some really inspiring um, areas. So. We didn't have Andy on, but we did have one of his colleagues uh, do a really fun interview with us. This was Matt Hahn from Indiana University. This is episode, I think, 35 of Twivo, Never Not Neutral. We were talking about neutral theory and 
versus selection and some of these sort of thorny topics um, that Andy and, and Matt weighed in on. It continues to be sort of a, a provocative conversation uh, moving forward as well. Okay, Vincent, speak. I think I'm getting better at running these things, hopefully, uh, sharing my screen. Uh, speaking of, we'll see the uh, kind of uh, uh, an experiment in, uh, on the go here. So next up, speaking of our own species, humans, is uh, Sarah Tishkoff from uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania. Sarah is a, a human evolutionary geneticist. And so uh, we'll hear about uh, her in a second, her views on uh, what might be happening in terms of thinking about human diversity from a genetic perspective. Hello, my name is Sarah Tishkoff. I'm a professor in the departments of genetics and biology at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm going to share some thoughts with you about what I think are future directions in human evolutionary genetics. So one of the first things is that we need to do a much better job characterizing genomic and phenotypic variation in ethnically diverse populations from around the world. Right now, there's a major bias towards populations of European ancestry, but we need to make sure that there's inclusion of diverse populations. Then we need to generate large-scale uh, genomic data sets and to integrate that data with phenotypic data um, to identify regions of the genome that are associated with variable traits, including some traits that may play a role in adaptation to diverse environments. We can also do um, genome scans of selection, looking for regions of the genome that are targets of natural selection. Um, but using either of these approaches, the big challenge is how do we figure out what the actual functional variants are and what are they doing and what's their impact on the phenotype? So to do this, we need to use functional genomics approaches where um, we can look at the impact of these variants in cell lines, or we can look at the impact in model organisms. We can uh, use high throughput screening, functional screening approaches to uh, identify um, causal variants, um, including those that are impacting gene expression. And then um, lastly, I will just mention that uh, the study of ancient DNA has really revolutionized the field of human evolutionary genetics. And by sequencing Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes, um, we were able to distinguish uh, uh, signatures of introgression such that around two to six percent of non-African genomes derive from these archaic populations. But because DNA doesn't preserve so well in other regions of the world um, that have a, a, a humid climate like Africa or Southeast Asia or South America, um, we haven't been able to get uh, DNA from samples that old. So the oldest in Africa, somewhere around 15,000, maybe 20,000 years old. But if the technology develops and we're able to get sequences from um, samples in Africa that are 50,000 years old, 100,000 years old, or even older than that, I think it's really going to shed light on human evolutionary history in Africa. Okay. <laughs> really mm -hmm. cool. I love it. You know, two, two really important points, right? So our, even though we've been sort of touting all these great, you know, the influx of genomic data, Sarah pointing out very rightly that we haven't taken a random sample yeah, of diversity yeah. in our species. And so, yep. and this is where her group and some others, I think, are really on the forefront leading the way um, to bring in more diversity. And Sarah, in particular, her work in Africa, which is, um, you know, really unique, the relationships that she has um, with some of the groups um, there to be able to partner on some of these, um, you know, scientific pursuits. And that's, um, that's a complicated task. It's a, a, a task that has ethical considerations as well. And so, you know, doing that in a, um, in a really uh, organized and ethical manner um, is important and, and this is happening. And, um, and, and I think a, an incredibly fruitful direction that really under, to begin to understand our history in a more holistic way um, in, in the next five years. And then of course the ancient DNA stuff, right? We've been talking about this a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, couldn't agree more that, that pushing the farther that as the technology develops and um, being able to push back farther into our past and sort of directly, I mean, it almost feels like um, the technology of having a time machine um, in, in order to look backwards in ways that we've never been. Yeah. Something Svante Pabo is on, right? 
There you go. Yeah. Um, also, uh, some other great groups on this, um, you know, the, um, these Danish people, um, SK Villaslev group mm-hmm. um, in Copenhagen, I think, is a, another uh, lab to, to um, keep an eye on in terms of the ancient uh, DNA work. Okay, let's keep moving here. Um, lots of great um, perspectives still to come, not even half through. So Dmitry Petrov is next up. Dmitry is a professor and evolutionary biologist in the Department of Biology at Stanford University. Um, Dimitri also currently serves as um, the chair of the GVE study section. This is Genomes Variation Evolution, sort of the one evolutionary biology study section mm. at NIH. Um, and so he's, you know, seeing all of the grant proposals coming through and really has his um, thumb on the pulse. Hello, Nels and Vincent. I never met you, Vincent, but uh, nice to meet you. Um, I'm recording a very short little thing that you guys asked uh, for, for your anniversary, um, about my brief thoughts about the future of evolutionary biology and what we're doing about it. Um, I think the, in my mind, one of the big shifts in the set of evolutionary biology has been uh, their ability that's been brought about through both conceptual but primarily technological developments to observe evolutionary change in real time, sort of directly observe evolution. Uh, when I started in grad school, uh, the, the study of evolution was considered to be the study of deep past and um, also of trying to learn from the uh, patterns that evolutionary process leaves in biological diversity. Um, to kind of to to extract the understanding of the process, so it's kind of reading Rorschach tests, and it's a difficult problem, and we spend a lot of time doing it, uh, but ultimately a lot is hidden from us. If the process is complicated, it's stochastic, and um, the it's hard to map from these complex patterns to the process. Uh, little by little, through the studies of, of evolution in real time by some of the pioneers like the Grants and David Resnick and, and others, we became more and more aware that evolution can be very rapid. As uh, genomics especially has been developing, it's become possible to see that it's actually happening on the time scales that matter to us, that matter starts to us in an applied sense, they matter to us in medicine, where evolution, let's say, antibiotic resistant, uh, resistant can happen very rapidly, or uh, even where the pathology of the, of the disease agent like HIV virus uh, deeply depends on its ability to evolve away the immune system and eventually drive it, drive it into the ground or evolve away from uh, drugs, anti, anti uh, retroviral drugs that people developed. So uh, study of cancer is the same way. We're becoming aware that it's very rapid evolution, in this case, in scales of years, or sometimes in months, um, that is the problem. So it's becoming uh, clear that it's happening really rapidly, and we're becoming, it's becoming possible to study it in, on the right scale. So I think we're just scratching the surface. We'll start, we'll, start, we'll start getting more and more data like that, be able to see it happen. And as we will see it uh, uh, happen at the right resolution, we'll see that the context matters. Spatial context matters, biological context matters, um, and uh, context broadly matters. And in doing so, we will also learn about the context, biological context, natural selection will tell us what matters to the organism. So I'm excited about that. So um, related, thought is that as we're learning how rapid evolution is and how the context matters, uh, the different fields uh, are becoming connected. So many of the departments of biology now are split into functional biology and ecology and evolutionary biology. But I think that even within uh, ecology and evolutionary biology, ecology was separate from evolutionary biology. I think now it's all going to come, come together because uh, Pretty much every aspect of functional biology, how things work, now relates to evolutionary processes. Evolutionary biologists cannot get away from understanding functional biology. Evolution is happening on ecological timescales. Uh, therefore, ecology matters. 
And for ecologists, evolution matters as well. Their organisms are not static, they're evolving in front of their eyes. So I think there will be unification of biology. And um, one particular area where it's gonna become even more prevalent is in uh, part where biology meets engineering, where people are trying to build biological circuits or uh, even organisms or communities. And it's become, it's everybody knows that it's very hard to build it because once you build it, it's not static, it's not like a car, it will evolve. And one needs to build systems that will evolve in the right way to the right uh, outcomes. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, uh, put together a community of micro microbes in the human gut, you don't want it to evolve to a existing state very rapidly, and it really might. So I think this unification of, of the fields, the coming them together, uh, I think naturally will have more integrative biology, more integrative evolutionary biology. And just being able to watch these processes at the right level of resolution and just discover what that level of resolution really is. So it's exciting times. Thank you, guys. Bye. You know, it's cool, Nels. I'm looking at this webpage, and Talia was an undergrad researcher in his lab in, in 2010. It's exactly right. It's a small world in science and probably even a smaller world in evolutionary biology. So definitely kind of a web or a network of yeah. uh, trainers and trainees, mentees and ment along the way in hey, cool. different combinations. But yeah, so a couple of fun points I'd like to lift up. So one, just uh, fill in a detail or two. So Peter and Rosemary Grant, the couple he mentioned, this is, um, you know, famous couple in evolution and ecology for Darwin's finches, the beaks right. on the Galapagos Island and so, some of those yep. really famous cases. And then, um, you know, of course, for me, teach, preaching to the choir a little bit, thinking about rapid evolution, but, yeah. you know, and not just in the host microbe, and, and um, Petrov Lab thinks about that. They think about HIV mm. uh, evolution, but also even in other creatures. So they're doing a lot with um, fruit flies and how season to season, the population might have major changes in the um, frequency of mutations, um, yeah. some collaborative work. And so, yeah, I think kind of redefining that and then kind of from that bigger view, right? So the um, bringing complexity back, I think we can, we'll continue to hear this um, from our, our contributors, our guests today on that notion of the democratization of model systems or going out and sort of bringing back, combining or connecting again to ecology um, in maybe ways that sort of traditionally happened, but maybe doing so in even a deeper way. Um, and then again, sort of these big thoughts, right? So how do we collide fields, engineering and evolution, mm. some of the implications of that where Evolution is really going to matter as engineering advances as well. Yeah, I think when you think about evolution on a rapid scale, you always think about viruses, right? But you can study it elsewhere. Absolutely. Yep. And we're just kind of scratching the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, on, on real. And, and you know, from a tra traditional sense, um, evolution, you know, I can remember when we were just starting our podcast and I uh, was telling some friends, non scientists, about this. and that the podcast was called this week in evolution as if evolution can happen in a week. Yes. <laughs> and the, but the truth <laughs> is it can, but our sort of traditional view is that it's millions of years, et cetera. And that's another, I think, major direction the field is moving into recognizing how quickly things can change. These sort of historical snapshots really miss uh, a lot of the action um, that's right in front of us. Okay, so let's keep moving here. Uh, we're going to go from West Coast to East Coast. Next up is Nancy Chen. She's a population geneticist at the University of Rochester. Uh, opened her lab um, a few years ago now. Um, and one of our sort of up-and-coming uh, superstars. So. One of the exciting directions that I see the field of evolution moving is uh, the increased availability of longitudinal data. Now that we have the ability to sequence almost anything. Um, you'll, you're seeing a lot of people sequencing ancient DNA from bones that we find in caves or sequencing museum samples or even taking temporal samples of natural populations over time. I think that the ability to generate kind of these longitudinal time series is really powerful because it gives us a greater ability to actually measure how allele frequencies are changing over time, which then gives us uh, a greater insight into the evolutionary processes. Um, we can 
better understand how different populations are changing over time and across many different time scales, um, depending on the timing and frequency and spacing of the samples that we have. Um, my lab is focused on trying to understand how populations evolve over short time scales. And we do so by combining genomics with these long-term demographic studies where populations of vertebrates um, are followed across decades. These studies are really unique because individuals are tracked throughout their lifetimes, which means that we can accurately measure uh, fitness in natural populations and have detailed, complete uh, individual life histories for hundreds, if not thousands of individuals over time. And this approach, I hope, will shed a lot of light on understanding how populations are evolving over short time scales. Because one, we know that evolution can, ha can happen relatively quickly. We now have many beautiful examples of rapid phenotypic evolution in natural populations. And if you think about um, what's actually causing evolution at the level of the genome, um, these changes in allele frequencies over time are caused by different individuals surviving to different for different amounts of time. Different individuals have different numbers of offspring and different uh, individuals move across the landscape um, and carry their alleles with them. So the way that we try to study short-term evolution is by looking at these individual level processes that are all contained within the pedigree. So the set of all relationships among all individuals in a population over time. And by tracking how the genome is inherited down through this pedigree and transmitted from generation to generation and linking that information with uh, individual phenotypes and fitness and other environmental measures that we we can get data from in the field. Uh, we hope to really be able to directly measure um, the different evolutionary processes that are creating allele frequency changes um, in natural populations over time. And hopefully this understanding of kind of the genomic basis of short-term evolution will help us better predict how populations will respond to changing environments or under, have a better understanding of rapid evolution in nature. All right. Uh, yeah, another good one. <laughs> you know, I noticed Nels, it's interesting. She, you know, talks about uh, evolutions and populations on a rapid scale and doesn't mention the, the models, the system that she's using, because it really doesn't matter, right? Yeah. She's, yeah, yeah. So that's right. To, to um, kind of generalize it. Although I will actually put a, a little bit of meat on the bones of that. So one of the systems that she's used to great effect so far and really to launch her lab is the Florida scrub jay. Yeah. So these are like blue jay like birds and it perfectly captures all of those sort of features she's looking for. So another way she frames is population genomics with pedigrees. So there have been, yeah. um, you know, naturalists who have been studying the Florida scrub jay in the population, um, so closely over, I think, the course of 50 plus years with incredibly detailed records about, you know, this nest had five eggs this year, this, the female had, you know, five eggs this year, four eggs the next year, how many of those offspring survived and then went on to have kids themselves. And so you get this, it starts to connect a little bit, maybe on the promise of those big ideas Andy Kern was throwing at us in human, thinking about human genomes and pedigree. Here, it's not only do you have now, um, in, some of her great efforts to sequence the genomes or to genotype some of the, the samples from these scrub jays, but then to connect it with that rich data that's been recorded in terms of the life histories. And then as she says, this opens up the ability to actually measure fitness because you know how many kids went on or how, and so, yeah, some really incredibly uh, powerful approaches using, uh, you know, a, a new potential model system in this case. Yeah, uh, yeah. And connecting to the ecologist. So a little bit of an echo Mm -hmm. of even what we heard from Dimitri, an example of how some really talented and clever um, scientists like Nancy are starting to uh, kind of deliver on the promise of, of those sort of unifying themes. I also can't help but to just mention, so I was just looking at her website too, um, <laughs> some of the fun regional meetings that emerged. So this is, mm. there's a great uh, logo here for the, 
I think this happened last July, the Great Lakes Annual Meeting of Evolutionary Genetics, um, the acronym being GLAM Evolutionary Genetics or GLAM EvoGen Meeting. And <laughs> <laughs> kind of a fun play on words there. All right, let's keep the ball rolling here, Vincent. So next up, we are going to hear from uh, one of the colleagues of Nancy. So the University of Rochester, um, where Nancy's lab is, is a hotbed for evolutionary genetics. And so we'll hear now from Amanda Laraquente, who is one of her colleagues there in the same department, really doing cutting edge work. My name is Amanda Laraquente, and I'm an associate professor of biology at the University of Rochester. I think that one of the many exciting directions that the evolution field is heading in is in the area of genome evolution, and in particular, in combining evolutionary genomic approaches with cell biology and molecular biology to understand how repetitive DNAs contribute to genome evolution. We've had this genomics revolution where advances in high throughput sequencing technology let us make reference genomes and sequence genomes of many individuals really quickly and cheaply. And we can use these data to study patterns of natural selection. But when it comes to the genome itself, for most organisms, we're not done. There's still gaps in the genome where the organization and the function and the evolution of the sequences that are in these gaps are still a mystery. And I think that the sequences that are in these gaps are really important for genome evolution. These are regions that are rich in repetitive elements like transposable elements or these huge blocks of tandem repeats called satellite DNAs. And we know that repetitive regions play important structural roles in cells, but we don't really know much about what they do because the repetitive nature makes them really difficult to study. What's interesting from an evolution standpoint is that these are the most rapidly evolving regions in genomes. Some of the sequences that are in these repetitive regions evolve in conflict with the rest of the genome or they're affected by conflicts. And these conflicts arise when genetic elements in the genome don't play by the same rules. So genomes are full of selfish genetic elements or cheaters that can proliferate within genomes or spread in populations despite being costly to their host. So to me, the compromise that host genomes make with the selfish and sometimes parasitic sequences that live in them is really fascinating. Sometimes the genome ends up repurposing these repetitive sequences to play some role in the cell. Some of the most essential parts of chromosomes are, have highly conserved functions uh, like centromeres, and they're deeply embedded in these repetitive regions or they're made of the repeats themselves. Rapid evolution here can have consequences for speciation and for chromosome evolution broadly. And even within a species, there's evidence for functional variation in repeats that has effects on uh, fitness. So I think it's important to understand the causes and the consequences of the rapid evolution of these repetitive parts of genomes. And while this is very difficult work in the past, and it's still really difficult work, we have new technologies like long read sequencing that help make progress possible, not only from the genomics perspective of filling in the gaps and asking what's there, um, but that help lay the foundation for functional and evolutionary studies. For understanding repeat evolution, I think that the work that's happening in the field at the intersection of evolutionary genomics and cell biology is really promising. There's a lot of exciting work happening here. In my lab, we combine population genomic approaches with chromosome, molecular, and cell biology to try to understand the causes and the consequences of repeat evolution. We use Drosophila species as models because they have relatively small genome sizes and a vast genetic toolkit. We're using new long read sequencing technologies to see how repeats are organized, um, but also to extend these analyses to many individuals and see how they vary in their repeats and in their genomic environments uh, to try to understand the possible forces that are contributing to their rapid evolution. We want to know if some of the repeats in the genomes um, have specific roles in cells. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to precisely manipulate repeat arrays and then estimate their effects on fitness. We can measure things like transmission through the germline, 
uh, to quantify any potential selfish properties that they might have. The roles of repeats in cells might be context dependent. And so we're also excited about newer imaging and genomic technologies that help us consider the genome in 3D space rather than you know, a set of linear chromosomes. So I think that combining evolutionary genomics with chromosome and cell biology is gonna help us understand how repeats and the conflicts that they tend to get caught up in shape genome evolution over short and long evolutionary timescales. Another great one. Bringing cool. in the repetitive elements, one of my yeah. appreciating the player, as the saying goes. Yeah. So, and I think an important point here, Vincent, that um, you know, we've we've heard a lot and, and we've lifted up as well, sort of this great, you know, let's explore all of these untamed critters that are not traditionally modeled systems. But I, Amanda makes a really compelling case to stick with some of these traditional models as well. So there's, you know, the thing that brought science to model systems like Drosophila, mouse, D. elegans, uh, those, are, those have real staying power. And the tools that have been developed, the resources that come along with that can allow you to ask really incisive experimental questions in this case about how repetitive elements, um, including things like retrotransposons, transposons, ancient uh, endogenized viruses still propagate through genome, sort of the impact that they have on our evolution. Um, to even So first to just measure, to understand what these things look like, which is a daunting technical task, as Amanda pointed out, and then to then push it to the next level to really understand the impact. No, I, I think it makes perfect sense. And, you know, the technology is driving all this, so you might as well use it to extend the old systems and really get all the details and then go into the newer ones and see what applies and what doesn't. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, also doing that um, to, in combination with thinking about, as she's pointing out, chromosome biology. So she mentioned the centromeres, right, in the cell biology, yeah. Yeah. which in the one sense is one of the most kind of, you know, important in almost mundane jobs of her yeah. chromosome is to have <laughs> a, a region of it that the cellular machinery can pull on to go from, as you're undergoing cell division, for example. Or undergoing meiosis through germline development yep. to be able to do those chromosomal dynamics. And then the fact that, you know, you've sort of outsourced, in a sense, this key job to these repetitive elements that can be super dynamic, super rapidly evolving, and sort of the crazy biological outcomes where yeah. things are chaotic and not so well behaved. Um, that's been an important theme, I hope, that's come through on Tuivo in our first five years, is that evolution is chaotic, messy, and totally, like, this is not what an engineer would do. This is what mm -hmm. biology did in this long-running, multi-billion-year sort of natural experiment, and the outcomes are the mess. <laughs> and so yep, sure. starting to pull that apart is a pretty interesting pursuit uh, into the future as well. Okay, so let's circle back. I should have, I have, I'm a little out of order, but I think we're back on schedule now. So next up, we're going to hear from John McCutcheon, uh, who describes himself as an evolutionary cell biologist. John's lab was at the University of Montana for many years, where he's been doing incredible work that he'll be discussing in a moment here. And then he just recently relocated and set up shop at Arizona State, another um, growing center of really interesting uh, evolutionary biology going on. Hello, this week in evolution listeners. My name is John McCutcheon. I'm a professor at Arizona State University. And I am going to tell you and show you a little bit about what I think is an interesting question in evolution, and maybe a little bit about what my lab's doing about it. So uh, my lab works on bacteria mostly that, that live inside of insect cells. And, and so probably normally when you think of a, a bacterium that lives inside of an insect cell, you think of something that's bad for it. But I'm kind of interested in bacterial infections that are good for the host. So in general, um, the field, I think, there's a lot of people thinking about this. It's not just me, but there's these questions about host plus microbe relationships. Uh, the host being like us, a human or an animal, and in, in the case of my lab, an insect, and the microbe being something else like a bacterium or a, a fungus or a virus or something like that. So the, the, the questions are, how do these interact and what are the outcomes for each of the members of the, of the relationship? And so there's there's lots of different kinds of things you 
probably know about. Uh, there's, there's lots of pathogens, right? Bacteria and viruses and fungi that are deleterious or bad for the host. So for example, mycoplasma, uh, sexually transmitted disease, chlamydia, coronavirus is all too familiar to people now. And those are, those are bad for hosts. So there's, that's not very controversial. Lots of bacterial or viral or fungal infections are bad for the host. But there's also things at the sort of the other, completely other end of the spectrum, which are bacteria or things that used to be bacteria that, that live in host cells that are good for the host. So the most famous case being the mitochondrion, the powerhouse of the cell. That's just, from my perspective, that's just a very old bacterial infection. And, and plants and photosynthetic eukaryotes that get energy from the sun have something called a chloroplast, which again is also a very old bacterial infection. Um, so the insects I work on, uh, they have bacteria also that are, that are stuffed together in special insect cells. And these bacteria make nutrients for the host. And the host of so the host insect cannot live without these bacteria. These are required beneficial uh, bacterial infections. And so these are examples of things that are good for hosts. And again, that, that's pretty clear. Uh, but what I think the interesting question in the field and what my lab is just starting to organize ourselves around the idea of context dependency of infections. So if you, if you think about a bacterium infecting a host cell, uh, there are lots of examples, thankfully, uh, where the host, like someone like us, we get an infection and the host will win that, that, that battle in the sense of the pathogen will be killed and will, will proceed on. So the host wins. Uh, there are, of course, unfortunately, other situations where if a cell gets infected with some entity, that entity will take over the host or take over that cell and, and the pathogen, that will be a pathogen uh, and that will win at some point and the host will die. Um, but what I think is really interesting are, are cases where you get a bacterial infection and it, it doesn't fall into either of these categories. Uh, the host wins in an endosymbiosis, the, the, like a mitochondria or an insect endosymbiosis, the host wins. Uh, but the bacterium becomes uh, a helpful part of that host. Uh, and if you, if you think about where these come from, it, it's actually unknown, but I, I sort of suspect they often come from pathogens or mild pathogens. And then in some contexts, the host is able to take over this bacterium or this fun fungus or whatever, uh, even viruses or genes in some cases, and, and make it their own. So I, th I think one really interesting question uh, in the field of evolution are these sorts of host microbe interactions, but how they change in different contexts. So the context of the host, the context of the pathogen, and then the context or the microbe, and then the, the context of the entire outcome of the relationship. Um, so we're, we're interested in studying that and uh, we're going to try our best. So uh, hopefully that was mildly interesting. Um, and thanks for listening. There's the first guy in his lab. That's right. That's when you, that lonely moment when you move your lab from one institution to another. Now there are a few people who went with him from, Montana to Arizona, but yeah, you can see he's just setting up shop. In yeah. I mean, uh, endosymbiosis is great. Talk about that a lot on TWIM. And, uh, I, I just, you know, I'm glad he pointed out the mitochondrion chloroplast because Ed Young was co is quoted on his webpage saying the you know, it's insects is where the cool stuff happens, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Mitochondrion chloroplasts are pretty cool, right? They are. So and you can, Ed has covered a lot of work from the McCutcheon lab. Yeah. Um, cause these, Insect symbioses, not only is, uh, you know, so I agree with you, of course, um, but not only are they happening, but they're just happening these like dramatic, yeah. elegant, really beautiful ways that just really capture your imagination. And so the McCutcheon lab is continuing to really, to really push here. Um, a couple of points here. So we did, um, you, you've covered it a, symbiosis a lot on TWIM for very obvious reasons. We've done just a hint of it here so far in TWIM. I would imagine you'll be hearing more of this in the next five mm -hmm. years from us as well. Um, episode 20 in the company of Nidarians gets at this. So John made that point about sort of mild pathogens or just yeah, sort yeah. of those interactions and then somehow persisting. Um, I think that's a really interesting way forward. And of course, this notion of, um, I think it's very important we talk about this idea of, I mean, we've been hearing this in some of our other um, clips that, you know, 
this idea of conflicts or battles or, you know, especially as we think about infections, um, to broaden that out and, you know, to go beyond sort of that harmful view to a beneficial view. But then again, you know, it's a little bit philosophical, but when John says something like a mandatory beneficial relationship, I don't know, mm. that doesn't sound necessarily so benefit. That sounds like an addiction to me, yeah. which then falls back into this sort of, I don't know, maybe more sinister kind of framework somehow. But <laughs> anyway, um, really incredibly interesting biology. And I think again, with, um, you know, evolution sort of breathing life into it by taking these systems, but then having the ability to do some of the cell biology in some ways for the first time with the increasingly powerful tools to really bring that together in this growing field of evolutionary cell biology is John. Uh, also for our listeners, so John had a few slides in there. If you're listening um, just on audio to the podcast and so worth checking out, he has a great style as well as he was kind of stepping through um, some of those ideas. So if you wanted to check out the YouTube uh, version that we're, that we're posting. Okay, let's keep moving here. So next up is Ambika Kamath. So Ambika actually made an appearance, just a brief one in my pick of the week, uh, one or two episodes back. Ambika is a senior postdoc fellow, um, Miller fellow, I believe, at the um, at Berkeley, sort of a super postdoc position. And then we'll be opening her lab shortly, um, I think maybe this winter, at Colorado Boulder. Um, she's a behavior ecologist, an evolutionary ecologist. Hi, This Week in Evolution. Congratulations on five years, and thank you for this opportunity to tell you about what I think about the future of our field. My name is Ambika Kamath. I'm a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley, and I'm a behavioral and evolutionary ecologist. And increasingly, I'm also an interdisciplinary scholar working on understanding how who we are as people, the many dimensions of our human nature, affects not only the questions we ask in behavioral and evolutionary ecology, but also how we answer those questions. And I've recently experienced um, an expansion in my thinking about the conceptual underpinnings of how we think about how we study adaptation and natural selection. And this expansion has arisen from weaving together dialectical thinking, philosophical considerations of agency, and feminist standpoint theories together with my actual lived experience of being a behavioral and evolutionary ecologist and also a worker represented by a union and also a person living in a neoliberal world. And specifically, I've come to understand that how we tend to think about adaptation depends on these implicit and deeply embedded political perspectives that we don't talk about often enough. And so I'm currently working on arguing that in a paper, the deep conceptual progress in our field hinges in part on making these implicit political perspectives explicit. And my goal here is not to replace our current understanding, of course, but to make room for an understanding of nature that is rooted in a multitude of explicitly acknowledged political perspectives. And at the moment, my work is um, on, in this domain is all conceptual and theoretical, but the big question, of course, is what are the practical empirical implications of holding these multiple explicit political perspectives at once? And so asking that question, and I have no idea where that's going to take me, um, is going to be the focus of the work in my lab in, that's starting up next fall in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Colorado Boulder. Really interesting ideas yeah. from Ambika. Okay. It reminds me of what, you know, if you, um, you know, your colleague there at Columbia, um, colleague and author, Stuart Firestein, and some of his the ideas that he puts up in his book, um, Failure, Why Science yeah, is So Successful, right. and sort of what are some of the blocks of progress in the field. And so I think Ambika is sort of attacking that in a new way. And I think that's really, um, really has some uh, great potential to open up some, uh, some fresh air in some ways for how we think about in, in big ways, the, you know, how the things around us impact our work or, or, or the scope of our. Th uh, I think that's what we need, right? We always need fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> we always right. need people with different views to make you change the way you think. Otherwise we get stale and don't progress. Yes. And there's could be some good evidence of that on hand. And I think some corners of science and other parts of our society as for well. sure. The other thing I love about this is how, how Ambika is really putting it into a scientific perspective when she says, I have no idea where this is going, right? That's, mm -hmm. That sounds very scientific to me, this, this uh, notion of exploring, following your nose, and seeing where it goes. 
You know, when people say they had a revelation in the way they think about something, I really like that because I don't think I ever did. I think I just thought about problems in the same way my whole career, which is not to say it's bad. You know, we, my most important contribution is to train people to do science, right? But I really like when people recognize that they look at things in a really different way and they recognize that point in time when that happened and then translate it. I think it's really rare. So I'm looking forward to seeing where she goes. Yeah, me too. And uh, it could be a fun guest on future shows as well. Yeah. As we look forward. Hi, Nielsen. Vincent, thanks so much for the invitation to share some of my ideas about exciting directions in the field of evolution uh, and what we're planning to do about it in my own lab uh, moving forward. I've studied genetic diversity my, for my whole career, now coming up on 40 years since I earned my PhD. Early on, we focused on diversity in proteins and morphology, but soon due to technical innovations, we're able to explore DNA variation on a small scale. During that time, we had the opportunity to develop and test predictions about evolutionary relationships among organisms and processes, uh, but we're often limited by the sample sizes of DNA uh, from populations that we could get. That limitation really no longer exists, and we're literally drowning in sequence data from many populations and many species due to a variety of technical innovations. Um, we now know that, mo know that most species, including humans, harbor an enormous amount of DNA variation. This explosion of uh, DNA data um, has provided finer, in, uh, fine scale insights into the importance of both natural selection and demography on the distribution of genetic variation species. And it has also allowed for stronger predictions of where and how natural selection has acted on the genome, including even over seasons and years. But what is the functional significance of all this variation? And what are the evolutionary forces that are shaping the variation? The challenge for interpreting the evolutionary and functional significance of genetic variation um, has dramatically increased also for humans, uh, where the sequencing of tumors and families has led to an explosion of variants of unknown significance from the medical perspective. And now increasingly the ability to sequence um, uh, skeleton, DNA from skeletons of individuals, even 10,000 or more years uh, old, uh, in fact, has revealed a whole new pattern of genetic variation, and even replacement of different populations uh, that we previously uh, didn't know had occurred in different parts, in different parts of the world. Now, since the analysis of sequence variation within and between uh, species provides us a window uh, into the nature's laboratory evolutionary notebook, so to speak, um, uh, what has worked and what has not worked in nature, the appreciation of this population genetic perspective has become deeply ingrained in medical as well as evolutionary uh, genetics. In fact, classical geneticists have long focused on um, laboratory-induced mutations that altered phenotype. But they're now finding variation in natural populations to be just as valuable an adjunct tool for dissecting the function of genes and their regulation. From an evolutionary biology side, uh, this has allowed for an unprecedented amount, a level of integration of functional and evolutionary studies with the goal of inferring not only the functional implications of individual sequence variants, but also of the nature of the resulting phenotype on which nature has selected for or against. Our own research uh, is focused on a group of genes that are critical for a species reproduction uh, and thus persistence. Um, these genes regulate the production of eggs and sperm, their so-called germline stem cell genes. Now, we focus on this process in fruit flies largely because of the extensional, extensive functional information that's already available and also the evolutionary information that's available from a variety of species and the fact that we can manipulate these genes uh, fairly readily uh, without having ethical uh, and other kinds of um, uh, societal uh, concerns being raised. <clears throat> now, while the genes that control this process might be expected to be strongly conserved among species, we found that instead several of them change very, very rapidly, uh, in other words, evolve at the protein sequence level in some but not all species. Is this rapid change uh, due to a change in function or is there some sort of evolutionary conflict uh, driving 
uh, this uh, change. Our understanding of gene function often comes from studies in only a few species, which we often call model organisms, that are, have easily been easily studied and studied for a long time. We've got lots of really neat tools to manipulate and study those genomes. But the advances in molecular techniques, including gene uh, editing and so forth, have allowed us to expand into other species as well. And one of the things we've recently found is that genes critical for gamete production in one species may not be critical at all or may not even be important in another species. That is, the genes controlling this gamete production, uh, in fact, differ between closely related species. How can this be happening? This is such a critical function. How can you be swapping out the genes that regulate this process and still maintain uh, function? What are the evolutionary forces promoting uh, this change? We've also found that certain bacteria can target the genes directing reproduction in ways that benefit the bacteria, but may be harmful to the host. And so there may in fact be a conflict going on there as well um, between uh, evolutionary forces from the bacteria and evolutionary forces acting on the host. These studies really drive home the fact that evolutionary change is dynamic and multifaceted, both in terms of the phenotype, but also in terms of the genes, uh, and that we need to study the evolution of genes in the broadest context, both within the cell uh, and within the organism, and in the context of the organism in its environment. And I think this also drives home an important point that studying diversity, studying, in fact, different groups of even closely related organisms may reveal striking differences in how processes are carried out and the mechanism by which uh, evolution, in fact, uh, occurs in populations. So this, to me, is one of the real exciting features, this integration of evolutionary inference and population genetic um, inference about process uh, with, with then trying to test and find the actual functional uh, consequences of that variation and to understand the evolutionary forces that are actually uh, shaping that variation going forward. Thanks. Have a great day. Well, right. It's now is once again no mention of the organism. Uh, a little bit with Drosophila. Fruit flies came in, but yeah, but you no, know, he's clearly working on a lot of systems. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and but the question is the thing. It doesn't matter what the system. That's right. And then you use a system or a set of systems that will help you to yeah. make progress. But you know, that's exactly right. So that concept again, you know. I, it's now, hopefully, for our listeners, becoming obvious some of those themes that keep kind of cropping up or almost converged. Mm -hmm. So rapid processes, again, um, in this case, thinking about the germline, yeah. eggs and sperm, and then but throw, throwing in a microbial twist with, the, with some of the, um, like, how did this get involved in the biology? And again, sort yeah. of seeing that playing out in some of these other independent research programs. Um, yeah, so I think just really exciting. Um, and uh, you know, just I wanted to make a quick note too, is that I think um, it, because we're kind of talking about the field of evolutionary genetics or evolutionary biology, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Chip is one of these long-running yeah. uh, colleagues who not only is doing incredible work and really pushing the envelope, pushing the field, sort of pushing others and training others, who then become the leaders into that, but he's doing it in such a way to promote. Uh, you know, a little bit of what we heard from Abaca to bring in other ideas, different to support people to bring in. Um, you know, in value, um, uh, you know, not, not just the scientific side, but the human side of what we do. And that really matters for a field. You, you know, even a few um, cases, either positively or negative, can really move the culture of an entire field. And so I think evolutionary genetics, evolution, um, of course, is not immune to what we see with a lot of, uh, you know, human foibles, et cetera. But there have been some real points of light, positive uh, mentors and influences, and Chip is in that category, yeah. one of the leaders of that. All right, let's keep going. We're um, <clears throat> burning into the uh, final approach here. So our next clip is going to be from Rebecca Rogers. She's something of a genome hunter at uh, UNC Charlotte, um, and uh, her lab has been probably in operation, I'm guessing coming up on five years, something like that. Another population geneticist. So hi, my name is Rebecca Rogers, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Bioinformatics and Genomics at UNC Charlotte. My lab studies complex mutations, things like duplications, deletions, 
and chromosomal rearrangements, or GEs. And these are mutations that take big pieces of DNA and copy or shuffle them and move them around the genome. In the past, we have shown that these mutations are really good at creating brand new gene sequences where there weren't any genes before. And we study how these new genes help organisms adapt and do new things, and how they interact with natural selection, and also how these mutations may end up doing bad things that may cause disease. When I first started with my career, we had high quality genome sequences for model organisms like Drosophila. And it was possible to find these cases of new genes and look at how common they are in populations and find signatures of natural selection that had acted in the past because these new genes provided benefits to the organisms that had them. We also saw some examples where it seemed like these mutations may be doing bad things and were more detrimental than other types of mutations and could be causing disease. And so we study the interplay between selection and genetic novelty in our lab. Now genome sequencing has progressed enough that we can start to look at these mutations and their role in evolutionary change in any animal that we want to. We already know that in organisms like fruit flies that they can produce new genes that help organisms adapt. We see signatures that some of these new genes actually end up doing bad things instead of good things. We can go look at how these mutations operate in other evolutionary systems, in other animals, to see whether we find the same kinds of genetic stories in other animals. In some cases, we do see similar stories where these mutations form new genes that are important for male reproduction in both fruit flies and in humans or Neanderthals. And so this may be one general rule across the tree of life that holds no matter what the animal is. We're also interested in scenarios where these mutations start to play a bigger role. When populations get small, these mutations could accumulate based on theories, and bad things could start to happen in genomes, and these mutations could start to play a bigger role in both negative and positive changes. When you get strong selection in an endangered species, do these mutations matter to help organisms to adapt to very new and different selective pressures? Do they end up doing bad things in the genomes of endangered species? We previously found that lots of bad mutations were accumulating in mammoth genomes shortly before they went extinct. When the gene pool gets small, some of the bad mutations that are formed through complex mutations may be tolerated when they wouldn't be tolerated in a big population that has lots of animals that compete with one another. So that's one case where we see a different genetic story occur because of the difference in population sizes. We want to explore these concepts in the future, looking at the same types of mutations in lots of different animals. Here the genes form the central story, and we can see how they behave in lots of different evolutionary contexts. We are still studying these mutations in fruit flies to see how they play a role when um, organisms invade brand new environments like invading different islands. We're also looking at other species that may be threatened or endangered, like woolly mammoth's cousins, the Asian elephants, to see whether or not those genomes also harbor signatures of these complex mutations causing either negative or positive genetic changes. And we're really interested to see what kind of results emerge from that, where we can take a finer look at the evolutionary processes that define genome content and define different gene sequences to see how evolution may change when population sizes get small. We have other evolutionary systems that we're looking at where populations have also changed and gotten smaller. We work on freshwater bivalve genomes, which are rapidly going extinct throughout the southeastern United States. There, the population size has again gotten small, and we want to know do the duplications, deletions, and rearrangements play a bigger role when the populations are faced with very strong selective pressures where they need new genetic material, and how much is affected by genetic drift when population sizes become small, the small gene pool affecting their genome content. And we want to know whether there's a tipping point. Here we have a parallel case of population sizes crashing 
but the absolute number of individuals is still larger than the number of individuals in elephant populations. Do we see similar stories just because population sizes are declining? Or is there a tipping point in terms of population sizes where these mutations start to matter more? And we're starting to see new and exciting results show up from that, where duplicate genes seem to be responding to selection in freshwater bivalves. And we also see bad things happening, like transposable elements proliferating like wild in those populations. So by looking at genome sequences from very different organisms and studying similar mutations in lots of different animals, we can start to see how these function in adaptation and in negative changes that happen because of genetic drift and get a more complete portrait of how these mutations matter in evolutionary theory. Very cool. Yeah, agree. And again, sort of drawing from across the board with yeah. in order to explore that theme, sort of the interplay between population dynamics, especially as population might be crashing or approaching extinction. Yeah, yeah. That's very um, interesting. Yeah. To link that to what is what's happening in the genome and are there patterns. Yeah, and, and sampling lots of different organisms to get a, an overall idea. I think that's really very powerful. Yep, agree. So good, good things happening over yeah. in Charlotte there coming out of the Rogers Lab. One keep an eye on. Okay, so let's move into our final um, scientific uh, clip here. This one is from Yanni Brandvain. He is at the University of Minnesota, population genesis. And... Um, uh, again, another great like regional meeting that Yanov uh, hosts called um, uh, Evil Twin, evolutionary uh, tw in the Twin Cities. <laughs> um, a great meeting that we had a couple years ago where actually Yanov took us all to the Minnesota State Fair afterwards um, and uh, sort of a group of evolutionary genesis hanging out and having a good time. Hey, this is Yanov Brandvain. And I'm talking about where I think there's exciting directions in evolution in the next few years. The thing I'm most excited about right now is the ability that we're having to simulate large and realistic um, data with complex um, evolutionary scenarios. And I think this is um, super cool because it allows us to do three things that we all want to do as evolutionary biologists. It allows us to look at these questions about sort of thought experiments about what might happen in different situations how we think different traits could evolve and, you know, the sorts of experiments that we just don't have millions of generations to wait around for, you can now do with realistic simulations. So I think that's a really fun uh, direction. Second, with these realistic and complex situations, you can model real world problems like, you know, climate change, um, changes in, um, land use patterns, et cetera. And you can think about how these could impact the evolutionary process and you know, what we might see. And third, with these large scale, you know, genome scale simulations, we can um, create different um, models of what um, uh, evolutionary processes we're interested in, see how those impact the genome, and then use those to um, develop things like machine learning approaches to try to see what can we learn about history from uh, from genomes that we collect? And for those reasons, I'm really excited about the future of large-scale realistic simulations um, for our understanding of evolution. One super cool thing about this is it's been largely enabled, not by huge modern technology, but just by a few smart people getting together um, and making good progress. So I'm really uh, thankful for, uh, for those people who have pushed these programs forward in the past. Um, handful of years. All right, I'm excited to see where this all goes. So there's Yaniv making a call for large scale simulations and sort of spinning out all of these things from an evolutionary standpoint, mm. from a population genetic standpoint, so getting at sort of the quantitative, maybe the, the combination or the collision um, kind of in computational space and computational power. Yeah. His, his lab is called the Higgledy Piggledy Lab. Oops, sorry, I'm muted. Oh, I lost your, there we go, last sorry. year. No, uh, his lab is called the Higgledy Piggledy Lab. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yaniv is also one of the more interesting characters um, around, and uh, you know, I think doing it that recording kind of it has almost this dreamlike quality. Sort it of does, yeah. Sort of really fun and kind a of different direction. He says uh, one of his extracurricular interests is beer and whiskey. 
<laughs> Sounds like you, Nels. Yeah, I, I'm, I can I can drink to that. <laughs> and um, but I do. I also really like this. Um, Yaniv's point right at the end, actually, so that this isn't. You know, I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea of like big science, yeah. or it's all becoming almost like an industrial complex. And yet, um, what he and uh, some of the others, some of the really exciting things happening is is just a few people coming together, putting their heads yeah. together, and then because all of these tools, um, whether it's computational, quantitative, um, all of the genomic scale kind of stuff, we're thinking of as Chip, I think, described it, this drowning in data yeah. um, that we can actually make some headway by just banding together, not necessarily as like an entire, you know, ever company or something like that, but just three people drinking some whiskeys maybe on the weekend. There's, there can be some real progress. Like, yeah. so. All right. Well, we've come to it, Vincent. That was our, our smorgasbord, maybe more than a tasting menu of just really, I think, fun for me, really inspirational really just good. to hear this kind of from a few different angles. and. And kind of from all points on the map, um, mm-hmm. kind of uh, delivering, I think, hopefully on a little bit of what Tio was saying in terms of um, some of the organizing principles of Twivo, both in our first five years and the five years ahead. So now I will see if I can pull up our special musical presentation. I just call to say I love Twivo. <laughs> I just call to say how much I care. I just called to say I love Twivo, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Happy anniversary, Twivo. <laughs> I know who that is. <laughs> Very clear who that is. It's your old <laughs> boss, man. <laughs> That's right. Army Bullock uh, came in again, maybe right in the middle of the night <laughs> for that uh, final contribution. That's perfect. Sure. Perfect ending. There we go. I think Harmeet might want to stay with his day job as <laughs> yes. over to um, a musical <laughs> profession, but um, no, that sentiment is uh, well received. And uh, as a mentee of Harmeet, trainee of Harmeet, I continue to feel his support and uh, some of that positive energy that um, is kind of a thread through all of the uh, clips that we listen to today. So I leave um, this sort of experiment in recording, uh, really just pumped up, really energized, excited, optimistic. Um, obviously, I think if we look just outside of the field to what we're dealing with as a country right now, some real headwinds, but um, some real reasons for optimism underneath um, in terms of all the incredible things that are happening um, in, our, in our profession. And so I'm um, pretty excited um, for what you and I have shared in, in the last five years, Vincent, and even more excited for the next five years. Yeah, it's been a remarkable display of just incredible creativity in science. You know, just to have it all together is very impressive. And I think listeners should be amazed that there are these kinds of people doing these things. You know, we hear on a daily basis about people doing bad things. Uh, but here we have uh, an example of how good people can be, right? Mm. That's just great stuff. And this is why um, science is amazing. People are so creative. So thanks, Nels, for putting it together. Really, really uh, very impressive. Mm. My, my pleasure. And I think to our listeners, hopefully an invitation that the door is wide open for new voices, for more mm-hmm. perspectives, uh, for more exciting things. And in fact, the field depends on that. If it's going to remain vibrant, if it's going to grow. Yeah, uh, for sure. it's not gonna, it's yep, it, it needs to turn over. New things need to happen uh, for it. Looks like the sun is starting to set on your head, Nels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it starts still beating in here, kind of the middle of the day hmm. in all the lab studios. So, but it wasn't there before, so it must have come oh, below yeah. the window. It's, yeah, and we're moving, you know, into the fall season where the angle of the sun is really mm. coming. In. Yeah, yeah, I get <laughs> the same thing in my office too. Yeah, the sun, I'm on the um, western side of the building i look right over the hudson and the sun drops now and comes in my window puts a nice light on me like it's doing to you you want to do you want to end with some picks nels yeah let's do that so i've got one my science pick is uh something that we were just involved in a few days ago um this is an upcoming benefit for the science mill i've spoken a little bit about the science mill in the past i need to still get the um link in here i'll connect that for cool. a load the um, audio here channel. But uh, so anyway, so the science mill 
as an annual benefit. This year, because of the ongoing pandemic, it's not going to be in person. So Science Mill opens up generally for a really fun evening. Um, this is in Johnson City, Texas. It's about an hour west of Austin. Mm -hmm. And um, check out the Science Mill's website just to get a little sense of everything that's happening there. We've talked a little bit about some of the curriculum and building sort of science experiences for students sort of in the middle school age, but uh, both younger and older as well. So this year, there's an opportunity to join in on a, a virtual tour, um, which includes some fun interviews um, with, for example, Vincent Racchinello and Rich Condon, mm -hmm. the hit podcast This Week in Virology. We had the three of us had a fun conversation, which is being edited right now. And so you can step through that. And I think there's eight or nine other um, similar conversations. And this is with uh, NASA astronauts, ecologists, uh, people thinking about you know, engineering approaches in really new and exciting ways, machine learning um, and artificial intelligence, all kinds of um, really cool STEM pursuits. Um, so tickets are free. And then you can also donate as part of, if you can, or if you want to, you could also donate to support the mission of the Science Mill, which like a lot of small museums is undergoing some pretty strong headwinds with um, the challenges we're facing with the SARS-2 pandemic. So that's my pick, more and more access to um, conversations with great folks like Vincent and Rich on it as well. It was fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick? All right. For the second time in a row now, a, a link to uh, one of my sites, but this is really done by a listener. This is called uh, Das Coronavirus Summaries. This Das Coronavirus is a podcast that uh, German virologist Christian Drosten has been doing since the beginning of the pandemic. He's a coronavirologist, so he's been doing frequent podcasts in German uh, with, with the national radio station. And uh, a listener of TWIV, Irina Yakutenko, she is a writer and science journalist in Berlin, and she can um, uh, understand German. She's making summaries for us, bullet point summaries, pretty short. And there have been three so far that I have, and I'm, I'm putting, there, uh, putting them there more. And you can get an idea of what they talk about on the podcast. Uh, and then there's a link to the transcript of the podcast as well. Each one is transcribed. And if you open the trans, the, the podcast transcript is in German, but if you open it in Google Chrome, it will automatically translate it to English. So you can see the whole transcript if you want, or the summaries, which Irina is really kindly providing for us. So it gives you a sense of what he's saying over there uh, about SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19. Wow. Yeah, that's really neat. And did I just see, I think Christian um, Drosten just won some big prize or something. I mean, he's really contributing in many ways to yeah. Germany, stepping through the pandemic. Yeah. Right. Well, Nels, that is episode 60. Here's to 60 more. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you can find all of them at microbe.tv slash Twivo. And, you know, that's where we keep links to everything. Today, you'll want to see that because we'll have links to... Uh, all these individuals' websites, uh, which is great. Now, in, in the first uh, five years, we mainly released this as an audio podcast, which you can find on any podcast player. Uh, but now, the, first, the last few episodes, we taking advantage of Zoom, we're putting up video as well. So if you'd like to see uh, what's happening, there you go. You can find the link at microbe.tv slash Tuivo. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute and of course any questions or comments send them to Twivo at microbe.tv we'll get to them uh at self at some point sure uh nel zeldi is at cellvolution.org on twitter he's El early bird nels thanks for today and thanks for five years of Twivo. hey vincent this has been so fun thank you for uh getting me into this <laughs> uh, whole operation and i can't wait for the five years I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Tuivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, stay curious. Stay curious.